Sunday morning, but you are in the church to learn that on Mondays, Tuesdays, and, and during your weekdays, you can call upon his name, and he will come to change the atmosphere in your house. He will come to bring deliverance. He will transform your days. Doesn't make sense to live a life with Jesus and remain in the same pit, in the same darkness. He brought light. He brought light. I'm here to share communion with you today, but I really challenge you to see communion today as we think about his body, as we think about his blood, as we think about the sacrifice in the cross. Lord, What's the significance of the cross in my life? How does it affect my life today? Where do I need the power of cross in my life today? I'm pretty sure you know where you need the power in your life. And this power, it's in the cross. This power, it's in Jesus. Amen, church. I'm going to read here and we're going to pray before communion. It's still Colossians chapter 3, chapter 2, verse 15 that says, And now, on that cross, Jesus Christ freed himself from the power of the spiritual rulers and authorities. He made a public spectacle of them by leading them as captives in his victory. Does it make sense for you, church? He freed himself and his freedom, his resurrection power, it's ours. You don't need to remain in darkness anymore. You don't need to remain under, the, the, under this oppression that is ruling today in your home, in your workplace, in your friendship, in your relationship. You were free because Jesus paid that price already, church. So today as we celebrate communion, we celebrate the light. We celebrate victory against darkness. We celebrate that when we cry, when we call upon his name, he comes. So you can pray, you can lay hands in your house, you can lay hands on people and just in the cross, he had you in his mind to set you free, to change your life, to transform your days. Yes, Lord. We turn our minds and our hearts to you, Lord. You didn't die in the cross to give us a religion. You didn't die in the cross to bring us to church. Jesus, but you died in the cross to give us authority against all the evil spirits. To give us authority against the rulers and authorities that the hell is sending against us. There is power in your name, Jesus, to break every chain. Come, Jesus. Yes. Close your eyes, church. Ask His power to come upon your life now.
to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Break the chains here, Jesus. Break the chains, Lord, in our homes, in our workplace, Lord. Break the chains, Lord, because we believe in you. We trust in your authority. We trust in the power of cross. We trust in you, Jesus. Break the chains, Lord. Release those who need you, Lord. Bring healing. Bring deliverance. Bring light to the darkness, Lord. You didn't die on the cross to bring us to the church, but we are here, Lord, in this morning because you paid the price on the cross to set us free. We are free. We are free in you, Lord. Come with your light, Jesus. Come with your light, Jesus. Break the chains, Lord. Transform minds, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You paid the price, Lord. You paid the price to set us free, Jesus. Bring to your mind, church. Bring to your mind now where exactly you need that power. Where exactly you need that healing. Now it's the time. Bring to your mind exactly where you need his authority, Jesus' voice to speak among you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Because you are faith. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God, our Father in heaven, yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. And yours is the glory. Lord, we acknowledge your power here today. We worship your holy name and we thank you for sending your precious son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, to give us life and abundantly life. So Lord, I pray today and I speak against misery. I speak against depression. I speak against anxiety. I speak against brokenness. I speak against disease. I speak against sickness. I speak against divorce. I speak against brokenness in the families. I speak against lack of love. I speak against everything, Lord, that doesn't come from you. Lord, I know that your angels are all around this place, Lord. So, Lord, command your angels now and they can come and break the chains, Lord, and deliver messages, deliver healings, Lord. Because we gather here, Lord, not only to fulfill our schedule, we gather here because we trust in your power. We gather here, Lord, because we worship you. We gather here, Lord, because we know that there is power in the name of Jesus and power not only to preach but power to live the power of gospel in our lives the power to experience the power to see Lord your love acting among us Lord we desperately need your transformation in our lives we desperately need you Lord acting Helping us, enlightening our minds, Lord. Bringing healing. And we trust in you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for another chance today. Thank you, Lord, for your calling in our lives. Thank you, Jesus, because in you, we have a new chance every day. The same chapter, Colossians 2 says... For when you were baptized, you were buried with Christ in the baptism. You were also raised with Christ through your faith in the active power of God who raised him from death. You were at one time spiritually dead. But now you were free. You were Gentiles and you were dead. That you were dead in your sins. But now God has brought you to life again. Amen. We receive a new life every day. So Lord, we celebrate communion today. Church, you can take a seat now. 
Because now we're going to break the bread. And we're going to bring to our minds the price that he paid. He paid their highest price ever to make you free, to set you free. And the night that Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke the bread and he said, listen, as I break this bread, I want to tell you what it's gone, what is about to happen. My body is going to be broken. My body is going to be teared up. But uh, there is a reason for that. He paid the highest price ever to set you free. He paid the highest price ever. He gave everything. He took the shame. He took the hum humiliation to set you free. Now it's time to examine your heart. Do not, do not take communion without making sure that you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Without making sure you are so thankful for what he did in that cross. Because he paid a, a, a very a high price. So examine your heart now. Examine your heart and say, Lord, forgive my sins. Lord, I don't know what does it mean, Lord, but I know I need your forgiveness because I'm not perfect. I'm a I'm human being. I'm not, I'm not sure about what a sin I need to regret about, but ask the Holy Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit to tell you. He is the light, and he will bring light. Everybody is welcome to his table. If you are not a member, if you are visiting here today and you, you are thinking in your mind, should I take communion or not? Should I, should I take this cup or not? You are welcome. You don't need to be a member in this church. But the question is, do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Do you acknowledge that he died on the cross to forgive your sins and to give you life? So I encourage you to take the cup. Because today is the day that you make a new covenant with him. You make your covenant with him. You make, you surrender your life before him. We're going to have baptism soon. soon. Next Sunday, we're going to have baptism. And we just read in Colossians that with Jesus, when we decide for baptism, actually we, we decide, Lord, I want to die to my old life. And I want to come back again to a new life with you. Because I was dead in my sin, but now I raise up with you, Christ, Jesus Christ, to live my new life with you. Because you paid the price. This is baptism, church. So if you are not baptized yet, I encourage you to come. Because this is a starter. It's not the end. It's a starter. It's a very important step of faith in your life, the baptism. Because we decide to die for the old man, the old life, and come back to life again. Amen. So if you feel your heart prepared now, let's just have communion. Jesus Christ, one day, you set us the example to gather together and break the bread in remembrance of you. And you said, this is my body which I give for your sake. Every time when you eat the bread, you do that in remembrance of me, in remembrance of the cross. So when you eat the bread today, church, you remember that he paid the price on the cross to set you free. His body was there, nailed on the cross, to give you authority and freedom over all the evil spirits. And he paid the price to set you free. By his stripes we are healed. You can eat that bread. same way he took the cup and he said this is my blood 
the blood of the new and eternal covenant with you. Hey, do you know what does it mean, eternal covenant? That doesn't matter what you do. Doesn't matter where have you been walking. If you decide for Jesus, he has an eternal covenant with you in his blood. If you decide today that you don't want to live in your sinful life anymore, the covenant is there for you. My, the, the new and eternal covenant in his blood to wash up your sins and to make you a new way, a new, a living way to God the Father. So as you drink the cup today, as you drink the grape juice today, you think his blood is crying for me. His blood is there for me. His blood remembers me that he is waiting for me because he has an eternal covenant with me. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood. You drink, church. Thank you, Lord. With words of worship, thank thanks him in your heart. Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for setting us free. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We are often told, God loves you. But what does that really mean? That some impersonal force, galaxies away, may consider you from time to time? Or that you are a single drop in a vast ocean of humanity, and God cares for all of it? There are billions of lives, billions of stories, can we really believe he has great destinies planned for all of them? Surely the ruler of the universe has more important affairs than to notice the needs of one singular individual. But hear this, nothing could be further from the truth. When God says, I love you, it means that he crafted every detail of your being. Your every feature is his perfect design. His mind perceives your worries and your thoughts. His heart is broken by your pain. You are his child, created in his image. Your value exceeds all the riches of earth. Your worth extends beyond the stars. And though you may be unaware, He's carefully constructing the events of your life to build his kingdom. If you are willing, he can and will achieve wonders through your hands. It is the deepest passion, the most meaningful promise. It is your security, your hope, and your future. It is the truth beyond doubt. God loves you. Amen. Amen. How is everybody? As we dismiss for, for Children's Church, we're, we're doing something new. Children's Church is just going to be up until fifth grade. So... If you're a fifth grader or below, you can go to Children's Church. I'm sorry, sixth graders, we're going to stay in here and learn. So we want to take the kids back there up until fifth grade. You know what was beautiful for a moment was right there in communion, preparing your heart to receive something greater. To prepare, to prepare your heart for something greater. Too many times I, I see in churches, and I've been in churches where we shuffle out communion as fast as we can. Let's just get it done, mark it off the list. But really communion 
just like what we walk through, should be a time of worship, saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you that we get to have this moment right now. And then it's a time to reflect on what God's done in our lives. And it's a time to reflect on change. What changes do we actually need to make? And so in order to to sometimes make those changes, you need to sit and pray in the Spirit and pray, Father, show me how I can change. Show me how I can change my heart that I might prepare my heart to go to your communion table. Show me how to change my heart that my faith might grow. Show me how to change my heart so I know your love, Jesus. Show me how to change my heart so I might love the person across from me that doesn't deserve it. And unless you're in those moments of of worship and holiness, you'll never truly know what it feels like to be enraptured with God's love with his arms around you because you allow your flesh to take over your thoughts. You allow your sin to become more than your thought about God. To, to slow down and say, God, I, I'm not in a hurry today. I'm right here. Think about that for a moment. We don't, sometimes we're here an hour and 15 minutes, usually no more than an hour and a half. But it's easy for us to set through a two hour movie. It's easy for us to watch the Chiefs play for three hours. Man, I'm starting to hate those commercials. I don't, I don't ever sit there. I just fast forward through it later in the day, catch the highlights, and I'm done. But the Lord doesn't want us to hurry through what He's doing. And sometimes, as you're worshiping Him, the Word hasn't came yet, but as you worship Him more, and you start to step over here, the Word becomes stronger, and He starts to speak to you, and He starts to talk to you, and He starts to bring healing over your life, and and, and that Word becomes in your ears. Faith comes by hearing, and what? Hearing the Word of God. How does our faith grow? By hearing the Word of God. That's one of the scriptures I have today. The title of today's sermon is, Faith Requires Action. Faith often requires action. And how do we get that faith again? Faith comes by hearing, not hearing Pastor Troy, but hearing the Word of God. So if you want your faith to grow, if you want your faith to become strong, so when the the waves of the ocean crash up against you and you don't fall over and your faith is strong enough to withhandle the circumstances of life, you have to be in the Word of God. You have to live it. You have to breathe it. We go throw a burrito in the microwave and in one minute our supper is warmed up. We got frozen ice cream in there, and in 30 seconds we can have it thawed out and be dishing it out. And that's kind of how we get in a mode with communion and how we get in a mode with prayer and how we get in a mode with church. Man, the preacher is talking way too long. Man, when, when Pastor Marcelli gets up here, she can't help herself. She starts preaching, and hey, Troy's got a message too, and those guys talk way too much. Quit pushing the microwave button when it comes to God's Word. And just relax and enjoy what God's going to do. He wants you to enjoy His Word. He wants you to enjoy a message. He wants you to come in here and leave the trash out there. But even when you're out there, He doesn't want the trash pile to become greater than your faith. He wants your faith to become large. He wants your faith that when you pray, mountains are moved, so to speak. That the ground shakes. If I can encourage you guys today to walk through the worship of God in a way that you're not in a microwave process. Because I think today's world, we go through the drive through and man, if we have to wait 10 minutes, we sit there and go, they don't have it ready yet. I don't know about you, but I want my hamburger cooked. And I like, I like my hamburger and my steak a little bit pink, I do. But I still want it to that point. So, but we're in a hurry. We got all these things to do. And we live in that mode of got to get things done, got to get things done. And you guys that know me, I like to get things done. 
But when it comes to the Lord, if you want to get things done, you got to sit quietly. You got to worship quietly sometimes, and then you do have to worship loudly and open your mouth. But you have to sit quietly in that word and meditate on the law day and night, it says. Meditate on the books of those Bibles and what, what Paul wrote. It says there's no greater love than one who laid his life down for a friend. And sometimes we became in the world all about our agenda and all about ourselves. But is that what the person across from us needs to see? I talked about Wednesday night that, that your life was on display. Your, your faith is on display. People are walking by that display case and they're looking in there at the projects that are laid in there and built in there. Your, your life is a project. You're constantly going through a building process of your faith. You're constantly walking through things that the enemy's bringing at you and God's wanting for you. And somewhere in the middle they collide. And you've got to clean your display case and say, no, when the public walks by, I don't want them to see that. I want them to see Jesus. When the public walks by, I want to be standing over here and I want to be worshiping God. And I want them to see Jesus. But the enemy wants you to step back over into here in alcohol and drug addictions, and he's hoping that the world sees you. Hey, did you see that guy? He was in church on Sunday, but man, did you see what he did over at the bar? He was dancing on the tables. That's what the enemy wants to promote. That's what the display case that he wants you to have. But when you step over here where faith is at and say, Lord, can you strengthen me today so I don't step over there? Can you keep me over here with you today and build my faith and show me something new in your word? Can you take me to the book of Psalms and, and let me walk with David and praise you like David did? That's why we can't get in a hurry. The times that we make decisions in a hurry are the times that we get ourselves in trouble. God wants to download his plan and his roadmap of your life into your heart. And that takes time. That takes a building block. And allow God to, to, to so pawn, put another block and a block and a block and a block of faith into your life. And sometimes building your faith requires you walking through pain. As we're going to read in Scripture, if you'll go to Hebrews Jacob, pull up Hebrews chapter 11, I think it was. Is that right? And I want you, there's quite a few verses here. I may read them all, but I just, I want you to sit and, and enjoy what God's laying out in this chapter. Do we have that on the wall there? Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, for the evidence of things not seen. So some translations say now faith is the confidence of things hoped for, for the evidence of things not seen. I want to tell you about that word substance. There's a Greek word meaning cutoposis. It refers to faith as we were standing on it. The word substance means to stand up under, to stand on a foundation and come up under. We are under the word of God. We are under Christ. He is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So a lot of times we'll have faith in something that we're praying for. It hasn't happened yet. We haven't seen it yet. But we still have the hope and the assurance of the promises of the scripture that it's going to come to pass. That is a powerful verse. Verse 2. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which were seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, 
God testifying of his gifts and through it being dead still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found being because God had taken him for for before he was taken, he and his testimony that pleased God. So there you have two people. Abel was the perfect example of what sacrifice means. Abel walked with God. He gave God the very best sacrifices, the very best grain, the very best offering that he had. Enoch was a true picture of walking in perfection of faith. Walking in righteousness they were on display. They're on display in these scriptures of how we're to walk and, and what sacrifices that we still need to make for God. But without faith, it is impossible, verse 6, to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him diligently. Everybody say diligently. He is a rewarder, got me, of those who seek me diligently. Verse 7. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household. Verse 8. By which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents, and Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and marker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky and the multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, hold it right there, Jacob, were assured of them. What does he mean when he says not having received the promises? They heard of a coming Messiah, but they never got to see it. But yet they walked in faith, knowing and believing what God said, that he was bringing a Messiah. And as you walk down through each one of these verses, their faith grew for the task that God set them aside for. Even though they didn't get to see it, they still believe and acted. Is that, is that not where we're at today? Noah acted when God told him to build an ark. Dale and I were just talking about this. Those people probably didn't even know what rain was. Now, imagine this, and I have those scriptures in Genesis, but in Genesis, God tells Noah to build an ark because he's fed up with the people and their unrighteousness, and they're living in sin, and they're not changing. And when you read in Genesis, God is describing the exact measurements of how to build the ark. He's laying out the detailed map of what Noah is supposed to do. He was very specific. Now, I want you to see that. I want to, because there's about 25 or 30 of them I could go to in this chapter. But I'm going to where Noah was, and, and, and Noah's waiting on God, and then and he says, God, you want me to measure this and build this and do that and make it just perfect, and how many rooms do you want? I don't think ever once Noah said, God, you're crazy. I can't do that. We don't really, this was like the Titanic to him. He was building the Titanic without any Milwaukee tools. But can you imagine? Here's, here's Noah. He goes into town and he's going to the hardware store if they had one. And he's like, do you got any of those old Milwaukee saws or DeWalt saws? Do you have any? What are you doing with those, Noah? I'm building an ark because it's going to rain and flood. And now the whole city's making fun of him. 
And you know that those little brat kids in middle school are running around and they're picking on Noah and they're throwing on him and they're teasing him and they got slingshots and they're probably hitting him in the back of the head while he's building his ark. Going, that guy's crazy. But you know what Noah did? He didn't follow the crowd. He didn't follow the crowd. He followed God. He followed God. I want to encourage you today not to follow the crowd, not to follow God, or to follow God, excuse me, not to follow the crowd. I'm getting tongue-tied. Noah's eyes were on what God was wanting him to do. Noah's faith was built because he walked with God, he talked with God, he knew God. And do you think Noah... Once it started to rain and it started to flood, I bet he said to himself, I'm sure glad I listened because it just saved my whole family. Do you know that your faith can save your family? Did you know that your faith can save your family? Do you know that when someone's lost in your family and your faith grows and you stand strong when they're ridiculing and making fun of you, that when you stay strong, Jack, and you stay after them, that you can win them to Christ? And the world is going to make fun of you for loving Jesus. They're going to make fun of you and say, Troy's a Jesus freak. But you know what? I sure hope all my old drinking buddies come to Christ because I'm not running with the crowd anymore. I'm praying for those guys because I love them. I'm no better than they are. But you know what? I know Jesus. If you don't walk with the crowd, you can save somebody's life. And your family, your family is your first responsibility. So minister to them in a loving, kind way. And be patient with them when they speak horrible things. Be patient with them when they tell you no. I remember one time I was downstairs and I had a high school classmate and and uh, Carrie and I used to run around with him. We'd drag Main Street and do things that high school kids do. Remember that, Carrie? And uh, she's like, Troy, stop. Don't. <laughs> I'm real. I'm vulnerable because I want you guys to grow. But I, I hired a high school classmate that we used to run together, and he, he came to lay carpet at my house, and we were down in the basement, and he was laying carpet and, and doing some things, and God, I, I'm going to minister to his life. I'm going to witness to him right here. And I was walking through the word with him as he was working, and I was ministering to him. And, and uh, I'll just call him Bob for now. His name wasn't Bob. But I said, Bob, can I pray with you to receive Christ? And he said, no, Troy, I really don't want to. I'm not sure what I believe in all that. And I wanted to start to weep. This was my friend. He trusted me. I was close to him. And I was doing everything I could. But you know, it's not me or you who saves people. It's Jesus who saved people. And I was walking in faith, hoping that God would save him in that moment. And he chose, God wanted to, but the person wasn't ready. So it's not on God and it's not on me. But my faith allowed me to carry on, even after he said no, to still lovingly be beside him, not walk away and encourage his life. And do you know that he knows Christ today, that I saw him later on in life, and he told me that he'd come to know Jesus Christ as his Savior? Amen? So what I'm saying is, don't give up. Sow the seed and put it out there, and if they deny it, that's not on you. But what if God tells you to do it and you don't? Because I've done that too. And two weeks later, that person died. And I stood at their funeral and spoke. And I failed. I don't like the way that feels. Noah built that ark because his faith in God was strong. When everybody else was telling him no, when everybody else was telling him he's a fool, he kept his eyes on God, he kept the eye on the prize, and he walked forward. I want you to think about a, a, another person in the Bible. What about Esther? 
Esther, as you know, the story went on at the perfect time she was going to walk before the king and she did not have permission to basically go in the courtroom. If you went into the courtroom where the king was discussing things without his permission, it meant you would be put to death unless he held out his signet ring. God now showed through Mordecai that it was time for Esther to go before the king and tell him what Haman was going to do to the Jews, that she was Jewish. They fasted for several days. Sometimes we're required to fast before we go forward with God's plan because he's got more to speak. Esther, can you see her? She's in, she's in praying, she's fasting, she's weeping, she's scared, she's nervous. Because she's going to go before a bunch of men and it's basically just her. But all of a sudden I see faith. pushes those big doors open and she walks in and she walks before the king and the king loves her and he holds out that ring and she's saved and she tells the story that saves the Jewish nation God uses your faith for leverage what do you mean by that Troy God can use whoever he wants. But my point is, in Esther's life, he took her before the king to be his wife. And she was excited about being the king's wife. And she didn't know that there was a greater plan. But God was, was building her from here over to here and spending time with the king and loving the king and growing a friendship with the king. And she was just being his wife. She had no idea that there was a greater calling over here. And God used her for leverage. I'm coming in. I'm sending Esther in to save the Jewish nation. God is constantly building you in your life. And it's your choice to follow by faith or not follow by faith. Faith is an assurance. It's an, an anticipation of what's to come. Some of our faith is based on past experiences. Some good, some bad. Faith, it's complete trust in someone or something. It's a personal conviction to follow through and move forward. As I said before, faith does not follow the crowd. Faith is, is what matters, not rituals, not religion. True faith in God produces a repentant heart and, and walks in obedience. We saw how Enoch walked in righteousness. He walked in obedience. We see how Noah and Esther walked in obedience with a repentant heart. I promise you that when Esther was fasting, she was repenting. Are you useful to God and his kingdom? Listen, your faith should lead you to your destiny. Your faith should lead you to your destiny. But you'll never find your true destiny without faith destiny it's a hidden power believed to control what will happen in the future that's god's power in you building his kingdom for your future when you read through all of these chapters all of these verses that have been laid out in in chapter 11 there's samson in there there's Barak in there he said he said I don't even have time to mention David and Barak Barak was sent into battle by Deborah a, a, a woman leader who gave the battle plan who prophesied and you know what Barak's name means I believe it means in Greek lightning flash he went against all odds he went to battle when they didn't look like they were going to win the poles were stacked against him and he went to battle because his faith was strong and he saved the nation against all odds. A lot of times your faith seems to be against all odds, like it doesn't make sense of what's going to happen. That's what God does in our lives. David, there's a great example of faith. When David was just a young boy, he stood there and, and he looked at Goliath and he said, Who is this that defies the armies of Israel? 
Who's this that defies my God? And a young boy who couldn't even put the armor on as a king ran at a man that was so much bigger than him. And he took one stone and God directed the stone and with all faith, David killed Goliath. David had no idea that when he was protecting the lambs, that his bigger picture to become king, that his bigger picture to save Israel in battle would be over here. David's over here carrying over the lambs and, and he's fighting the bears and the lions and he's getting good with his slingshot and he's learning tactics of war by battling to save the lamb. God says, I can use that for leverage. Goliath's over here. David, when it's time, as your faith grows, I'm going to bring you up against Goliath. But if, if I leave you over here before it's time, if I bring you too early, your faith isn't strong enough to take down Goliath. Wait on the details. Sometimes God gives you a plan and a direction to head, but that doesn't mean you just jump into it. Just like David over here, he was building David, he was building Esther, he was building Noah. He brings them over here for leverage. But if you step into the point of leverage too soon and your faith isn't strong and you're not on a firm foundation, you'll lose. You'll crumble. Listen. Noah took somewhere probably between 75 and 100 years to build that ark. Some say 55 to 75. But even if it was 55 years, that's a long time to walk in faith. That's a long time to be ridiculed. Sometimes God gives you a plan so far ahead that you start praying, that you start fasting. He starts bringing in resources. He starts training you. He starts building you. And then you can step into it. His purpose is to build his kingdom. There's one thing that all these people had in common. They understood. They didn't seek earthly rewards. They didn't call earth their home. They kept their eyes on the God Almighty above and said, there's my home. God has my rewards. Abraham probably knew in all his heart and prayed that God would save Isaac when he put him on the altar. But he said that he would be the father of nations and that seed would come through Isaac. Abraham, I promise you, when he had the knife raised, he's going, oh God, you said my faith is strong. And his faith was carried through on one of the toughest things that God asked him to do. But God said, now I know, Abraham, that you'll follow me. Now I know I can use you for leverage. Now you'll know what your destiny is. Now you'll know that your rewards in heaven will be great. Now you'll see the promises that I came through. The problem is, you guys, we're walking through the world and there's so much prosperity gospel out there that oh God's going to show me favor today God's going to do this for me today that when something bad happens we crumble yes God is going to show you favor today yes God is going to bless you today but you've got to be walking in faith you've got to look at it the right way and even when pain comes even when suffering comes sometimes that's a blessing amen walk in faith and not by sight faith comes by hearing the word of God I want you guys to ask God to build your faith. And, and when people come to me all the time, and it's fine, they can, they can keep coming. I want you to come. But most of the time, the problems that they're going through is because their faith is lacking. And that when God asks them to do something, they don't do it. And so then your faith lacks. I remember one time, actually it happened several times now. I was praying for, for those who were going to come to work for me. 
and God showed me who, who this person was going to be. Two people one time showed me who they were going to be. And I, I, was, I was needing help. And when he showed me, you know what I did? I didn't call him right away. I prayed. And Carrie and I prayed together about it. And I waited. And I waited. Because I didn't get the word to go to him yet. But he showed me. And then the one person I bump into in True Value parking lot, and I said, hey, what are you doing? And they said, well, nothing right now. I said, would you like to come to work for me? I could use your help for a while. They said, sure. God made the appointment. One whole year, I waited one whole year later for the second person to show up. One whole year. God told me ahead of time, one full year. And one day my wife stood in the kitchen and she said, Troy, now it's time. I think you need to reach out to them. But she'd been praying. She'd been walking in faith. God, you showed Troy. You showed him. You made it clear. God, we're walking in faith, but we don't want to go ahead of you because we want the right leverage. And that person was in a position where they, they weren't doing well with their old job. But if I would have contacted them too soon and they weren't ready yet, they would have said no, and I would have ended up hiring somebody else. Does that make sense? But I walked in faith because God showed me who it was going to be. But it took a whole year. So that's the point I want to get you guys to. So we are in a microwave burrito ice cream world. I want it now. I want it now. God, you showed me. I want it now. Just because he, he told Abraham that he would be the father of nations. But that took a while. He told Noah that there would be a flood. But that took a while. And their faith required an action to build an ark, to walk in faith, to take down giants, to go before the king. So when you're praying and God gives you an answer, sometimes, yes, it is for right now because there's decisions that have to be made quickly sometimes. And God can do that. But I want you to consider to wait on the details that God shows you, continue to pray, allow your faith to be built through the circumstance that you're going through, and allow him to put you in that time of promotion, and he will win the victory for you. But it has to be in his time. Has to be in his time. Too, too many times we get a quick answer. Well, hey, Pastor Troy, that so-and-so spoke a word over me, and it just didn't happen. Sometimes it doesn't happen. Sometimes we need to pray into those words. But sometimes we're in too big a hurry and it wasn't meant for right now. But it's your job to pray about it. It's your job to ask God if that's what he wants you to walk in. And if it isn't, you just say thank you, I'll pray about that, and you move on. But there is those words that happen a whole year later, that happen two years later. And sometimes... Sometimes they happen quickly when you're praying over somebody. Sometimes you give someone a word and they happen quickly. Sometimes, Marcella, it's in your pocket. It's in the mail. Does that make sense? You guys receive it today? Has your faith grown today? Worship team, if you'll come forward. Lydia, your faith has grown. Lydia, I, I've seen you grown and, and God's moving you into a new place and a new plan. And I'm not going to announce it because you never gave me permission to. But your faith has become strong and it's changed you. And are you more joyful, Lydia? Are you more excited? And do you believe in him more than you ever have? But you know why it's like that? Because she dug in. She gave up the things of the world and chasing thoughtless things and, and thoughtless rewards and she sunk her teeth into the word of God and it's changed her life. Do not follow the crowd. Follow God. The crowd won't help you build an ark. The crowd won't help you take down Goliath. The crowd won't help you be in the right place at the right time. But you have to seek him first. Stand together as we sink out of the city. As greater things are here.
to come. Greater things are still to be done here. We believe. God showed me one day when I was standing up here beside my wife's keyboard that I would stand up here and pray or stand up here and, and give a word of encouragement, a word of knowledge. So, Father God, I just pray that we would truly seek your face. Father God, I pray that our faith grows strong, Lord. I don't know what double doors we got to open and walk through just like Esther did. I don't know what ark we got to build. I don't know what Goliath that we're going to take down. But, but I prophesy now in the name of the Jesus that the church will become glorified, that the church will become strong, that the church will become powerful. And that God's people will get off of the curb and step into the street where you're at, God, and witness to people, minister to people, that our faith will grow, that our faith will endure because you're a good and faithful and righteous God. And that things are about to change. That all the shaking that's being shaken is going to become greater, but in the darkness the light will shine and that you, Jesus, will return and you, Jesus, will find us faithful. So, Father, build our faith. Build our faith, God. With an outstretched arm that we draw near to you, you draw near to us, Father God. And that we work hard to love on those, even those who despise us, God. That we would have a kind and gentle heart, God, to change the world. And change is coming. There's a greater change coming than that we've ever known. Now, Father, I pray by your name, Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit, that you bring healing over your people. That whatever a person needs today, whether they're hurting of, of depression, whether they're hurting of cancer, whether they're anxious, whether they're just ailing from the flu, Father God, I rebuke that now in the name of Jesus. Oh, Father, there's some that their minds are battling and not right, that there's not peace in their mind, Lord. And I pray peace which surpasses all understanding. Oh, God, you are the way maker. You are the chain breaker, Father God. You, you change our minds and you prepare our hearts to do the greater works. Now, Father, help us set our sights on the things above and not on the things below. Now bless your people from this time forth by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. Amen.